Good afternoon. This is our closing presentation for the Career Writers Circle. Our presenter today is Silas House. He's a New York Times best-selling author of six novels, as well as a book of creative nonfiction and three plays. House serves as NEH Chair of Appalachian Studies at Berea College, where he also teaches creative writing. He's on the fiction faculty at Spalding University's MFA in Creative Writing Program. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to purchase his latest book, Southernmost. So if you could please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me in the back? We're trying not to use the mic if we can. I usually project pretty well. Um, well, I have prepared a lecture for you today, so I'm speaking to you all as writers. Um, so even if you're not a writer, maybe you're, you're hoping to hear something about writing. Um, I am uh, really glad to be with you. I'm so glad that this group does this, is doing this, and I see it growing every year. And so eventually, it's just, one of the things that I really hoped for when I came to Berea College was uh, for Berea to be more widely known for its literature. I mean, we're so widely known for our craft tradition and, and lots of other things. But there's such a literary tradition here, too, uh, with the, the main star of that being Harriet Arnaud, you know, who, as a Bria alum, and wrote what I think is the masterpiece of Appalachian literature, The Dollmaker, um, and many other writers. Um, so just one thing that I've uh, wanted to do to further that uh, legacy is every two years, I hold the Appalachian Symposium and we bring, the first year we brought in 22 authors at the same time to just sort of talk about the state of current Appalachian literature. Then that just about killed me. <laughs> <laughs> 22 writers, you know. That was, uh, so now we bring in two writers. <laughs> and um, year before last, we brought Lyra Van Cleef Stefan, who's a National Book Award finalist for poetry, and Rebecca Gale Howell, who's the uh, Oxford American poetry editor, just really beautiful poets, so we focused on poetry. This year, uh, we're bringing in Charles Frazier, who wrote Cove Mountain, mm -hmm. and most recently, Verena, and just a, a great writer and uh, such a wonderful spirit. And he cares so much about the mission of Berea. He's coming for free, even wow. though, you know, he could fetch in the tens of thousands of dollars. And we're also bringing in a, uh, a, a, a new writer whose first book I am editing, and it's, it'll be published uh, next year. And it will be the first novel published by an Eastern Band of Cherokee by a major press. Which, unbelievably, there's never been an Eastern Band of Cherokee novelist. Her name's Annette Clapsaddle, so I'm really glad to bring her in and introduce her. And we're also bringing a wonderful singer-songwriter named Dory Freeman, who's from Southwest Virginia. So I hope you all will come. Please put it in your calendar. It's September 10th and 11th, and it'll all be in Woods Pen. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's easy to find on campus. So I'll just launch right into this. I thought I'd mention that since you all are literary citizens and we're going to know about it. Um, but I'm going to talk to you for about 45 minutes about sense of place. Since I'm, no, I can't do this without my glasses. Um, when people think of sense of place, they usually think this simply means setting. They think it means uh, something like saying that No Country for Old Men is set in Texas. Or that Beloved is set in Cincinnati in Southern Kentucky. Or that Brooklyn, one of my favorite novels, is set in Brooklyn and in its Corfe, Ireland. Or that The Color Purple is set in rural Georgia. But actually, sense of place is about much more than location, although the first thing is location. The best definition I can give you is that great sense of place captures the soul of the place where the action is happening. So we need to start thinking more about the soul and let a little less about the land, although we don't want to forget the land. But novelist, public intellectual, great 
genius Wendell Berry says, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. Well, unfortunately, a whole lot of Americans don't know who they are, and they don't know where they are. And so one of the roles of the novelist, or, or the writer, period, is to remind us of, of the importance of place, and how important it is, and to preserve. One of Wendell Berry's teachers is Wallace Stegner, who wrote Angle of Repose and lots of other wonderful novels. And he, he wrote an essay in response to Wendell Berry's assertion that I just read you. And part of that, and part of that Stegner said, he is talking about the kind of knowing that involves the senses, the memory, the history of a family or a tribe. He is talking about the knowledge of place that comes from working in it in all weathers, making a living from it suffering from its catastrophes, loving its mornings or evenings or hot noons, valuing it for the profound investment of labor and feeling that you, your parents and grandparents, you are all but unknown ancestors have put into it. He is talking about the knowing that poets specialize in. So, the setting is concrete, but the sense of place is abstract. So another word we could hear, use here is, is spiritual. Um, so I might go back, fluctuate back and forth between abstract and spiritual. But the concrete um, is sort of the undeniable facts of place. For instance, this bridge exists right out in Brushy Fork, and it's metal, and we can feel it under our feet, and we can touch it. But the abstract is the way Brushy Fork feels. That's, if we were writing about Brush for Work, that's what we would, we would try to capture this balance. We would describe the place and put the people there physically, but we also have to put them there spiritually. And I think the spiritual part is the more important part. But what people tend to focus on when we say sense of place is they'll just describe the bridge and not describe the way it feels to be in this place in the world. If, you, if you've not been here, it's one of my favorite places in Berea. It's not, not far from here. So the place should be a character in the story as much as the people who inhabit that place. Likewise, the story should never be set in a specific place just for the heck of it. The place has to mean something to the story. The main thing that you should remember about writing is that everything has to serve the story. Nothing is there just for the sake of being there. Poet Morris Manning continues this whole conversation that Wendell Berry and Wallace Stegner had, and he goes on, he has a wonderful essay called The Elegy on the Disappearing Place. It's all about sense of place, if you can find it. And this is from <clears throat> another, another tendency we have is to think of place as having synonyms like setting or location. <laughs> I don't think it does. I think there must be a distinction between place and location, between writing, which is merely housed in a generic setting, and writing, which is the gestational result of place. I love that phrase, the gestational result of place. Now Manning and Barry and Stegner here, they're talking about a luxury that not all of us have because they're talking about the fact that, that they have land that their people have had this gestational result of place in. Most of us don't have that, you know? For, for whatever reason, most of us don't live on the same piece of land our ancestors lived on for hundreds of years. Um, and so, in some ways, it's easy for Wendell Berry to talk about this gestational result of place, right? Because for generations his family has farmed that land and known that land and all that. But that's not what he's saying. He's not saying you have to have that too. He's saying if you don't have that, you have to create that gestational result of place. And so my lecture is about how we do that. It's about how we get to know place even better if, if we don't know it already. So I want to show you one of the uh, most common examples of sense of place. I like to use To Kill a Mockingbird because most people know To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a favorite novel of mine. It's a white fantasy, and I could do a whole lecture on that, but it's also <coughs> a beautiful book in many ways, right? And one way it's really beautiful is the sense of place is so palpable. Um, 
And so I like to use this example because it's a really great balance between the concrete and the abstract. Maycomb was an old town, but was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather, the streets turned to red slop. Grass grew on the sidewalks, the courthouse sagged in the square. Somehow it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. Bony mules hitched to hoover carts, flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon, after their two o'clock naps, and by nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square, shuffled in and out of the stores around it, took their time about everything. A day was 24 hours long, but seemed longer. There was no hurry, for there was nowhere to go, nothing to buy, and no money to buy it with. Nothing to see outside the boundaries of Macomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism for some of the people. Macomb County had recently been told that it had nothing to fear, but fear itself. <coughs> so we can break that down to the concrete very easily. We know that the streets are dirt or clay because they turn to red slop when it rains. We know that grass grows on the sidewalk. We know there's a courthouse, so then we know it's the county seat and sort of the, the trading place for the whole county in this time period. Mules and carts, and there are oak trees on the square. On the square. These are all undeniable things. And lots of these undeniable things are also giving us insight to the time period as well. The spiritual, or the abstract, it's a tired old town. The way the heat affects everything, it makes people move differently. Um, it, we see the flies flicking, you know, on the mules' ears, etc. There's a uh, poverty lives there, but there's a vague optimism. And that last line especially delivers the time period, if you know history at all because this is a line from FDR yeah. talking about the depression, right? Mm -hmm. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Um, so we're, we're being told what's actually there, but also how it feels to be there. And so we know a whole lot about it already from this pretty short little excerpt. We're getting a lot more complexity than the landscape, which of course is a part of capturing place. But the thing is, is that we're beginning to see how sense of place is shaped by many other factors besides the physical. Most people think of sense of place, again, as mountains or the beach or small town or big city. But capturing sense of place is much more complex than that. That's the word I use over and over and over as a writing teacher. The two words I use the most are complex and balance. Because those are the two things that you have to master to be a good writer. You have to master how to balance, and that balance is always about the complexity. We, and that's more important than ever too, because we live in a time of absolutes. Everything is put into boxes and absolutes. And for at least the last 20 or 30 years, our news has mostly been sound bites, unfortunately. And so, you know, we're used to a headline being all that people read before they'll share something mm -hmm. on social media, um, et cetera, et cetera. So as the news, as the, our world becomes reduced to those 140 character tweets or 280 character tweets now, right, or, or short USA Today style news, it makes literature more important than ever because literature must explore that complexity. It must explore that, the gray not the black and white, but the absolutes that we're living in. And so that's why I talk about complexity and balance so much. Also, I should point out that it's a pivotal time for literature to capture place because America is quickly turned into one big parking lot mm -hmm. and rows of chain restaurants and strip malls. Sameness is encouraged. Individuality is frowned upon. After going through a period of nonconformity in the 60s and 70s, since then the national attitude has been one that has shrugged more toward conformity to encouraging everyone to be the same. This is a direct reflection upon the overall attitude of the nation right now, a nation that promotes corporations over individuals, a national attitude that chooses wealth 
and superficiality over integrity and dignity. And then there's this homogenization, of course, a time when just about every small town has this part of town, right? That'll have this strip. And Berea has it too. And so a lot of people stop on the interstate and they see the strip and they don't come on into town and see the individuality of Berea and see that real sense of place. Now, not that this isn't a sense of place too, that's a, a sort of a one kind, and when you get on the square, that's another kind, right? Um, we've seen, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that I think sense of place is more important because the writer has to drive on into town, or has to drive out into the country, past the strip that's the same in every place. You have to get into the meat of the place and reveal what's unique about it, what's different about it, what it's. Uh, this isn't the heart and soul of the place. You know, this is total topography, this is total <coughs> physicality, and so it's a more important in literature because literature has to preserve. And we've seen this happen before in literature, especially around the time of the Industrial Revolution, when so many more books became place-based. One of the main people who did that was Willa Cather, my favorite writer. And she was really writing out of a sense of loss of what was being lost from the agrarian to the industrial and how that change was uh, you know, impacting the psyche of the people. Well, in one way or another, all writers right now are, are being really affected by um, an the digital revolution and the way that's changed us as a people, the way it changes you know, our psyche, the way we digest news, the way we get news, the way we get literature even, uh, et cetera, et cetera, this endless conversation about the way the internet is changing everything. Um, and so again, sense of place, really important, mainly I think for these reasons. In the opening of uh, O Pioneers, maybe her most famous novel, my favorite's My Antonia. But the opening lines are, One January day, 30 years ago, the little town of Hanover, anchored on windy Nebraska tableland, was trying to not be blown away. So this is great imagery for the novel, to open the novel, but it's actually really telling you what the novel's about. Because the novel's about people trying to hold on to their way of life when the industrial is creeping in, you know. And um, one of the main images from this book is of the plow setting against the sunset. It's become a really famous image because it's, it's becoming replaced by uh, gasoline uh, machines, tractors and threshers and things like that. So the, the first line is deceptive, right? I mean, it makes you think it's about something, but it's really about something else. That's the best. When, when you come to a book, I think, is when you get all those layers. As we get deeper into the novel, we realize how prophetic this opening line is. And another theme in the book is that people must work with nature to survive instead of working against it. Something Wendell Berry keeps telling us, and that people just won't listen. Um, and Willa Cather was telling us this 100 years ago, a direct indictment of the rise of the machine and the way it's quickly obliterating ways of life. Later in the book, we get this wonderful passage that gives me the title for this lecture. For the first time, perhaps, since that land emerged from the waters of geologic ages, a human face was set toward it with love and yearning. It seemed beautiful to her, rich and strong and glorious. Her eyes drank in the breadth of it until her tears blinded her. Then the genius of the divide, the great free spirit that breathes across it, must have bent lower than it ever bent to a human will before. The history of every country begins in the heart of a man or a woman. I love this thing <coughs> because in it we're, we have this main character realizing the power of the place, so overcome by that tears coming to her eyes. Um, and this is really the heart of the novel because it's about the power of place. And throughout the book, the land dictates just about everything about the way people feel. This idea also exists in Brooklyn by Colm Tobin. Uh, if you don't know this novel, it's all about the Irish diaspora and from uh, one young woman's point of view. 
uh, she has to leave Ireland for economic reasons, and she comes to Brooklyn, where a lot of her family have come to, and she's just so homesick. The whole book is about grief, um, and so she's in this deep grief, missing her people, and every scene serves that thesis, including this one. She liked the morning air and the quietness of these few leafy streets, streets that had shops only on the corners, streets where people lived, where there were three or four apartments in each house and where she passed women accompanying their children to school as she went to work. As she walked along, however, she knew she was getting close to the real world, which had wider streets and more traffic. Once she arrived at Atlantic Avenue, Brooklyn began to feel like a strange place to her, with so many gaps between buildings and so many derelict buildings. And then suddenly when she arrived on Fulton Street, there would be so many people crowding across the street and in such dense clusters that on the first morning she thought a fight had broken out or someone was injured and they had gathered to get a good view. Most mornings she stood back for a minute or two, waiting for the crowds to disperse. In this scene, Tobin is clearly showing us the beginning of the main character, Alicia's homesickness. She likes the neighborhood where she can see family life occurring, but she dreads going to where commerce is. For her, family is representative of Ireland, and commerce is representative of America. There are many brilliant layers at work in this one little scene about place. Sense of place is the heart of a piece of writing. That place, after all, usually greatly affects the characters and their actions. Sorry, I forgot to get a drink. Let's think about this masterpiece, Beloved, which anybody who's interested in writing, <clears throat> anybody alive should have read Beloved, just as they should, should have read something by Willa Cather. Um, but this, is to this book is totally dependent on place. In the novel, a slave, Seth, uh, escapes a plantation in southern Kentucky, and she manages to get to Cincinnati, where she is free. Once there, she's constantly under the threat of being recaptured, since she lives in this city that is separated from slavery only by the Ohio River. She can literally stand in her door in the land of freedom and look out into the land of captivity across the river. She can see Kentucky from her door. So think of the effect this place has on the novel about leaving slavery, about the ghost of slavery. And so even though there's a ghost in the story, the place is a ghost too to some degree. You know, it, it haunts her because she's always seeing the land of her captivity. <clears throat> The whole novel hinges around the fact that it's set at the gateway to the South, and the reader is constantly aware of how this affects the city of Cincinnati as well as the characters in the book. Or think about Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, another favorite of mine, and a winner of the 2005 Pulitzer Prize. Everything in the novel is dependent on the setting of Gilead, which is a lot like Berea. It's a town founded by abolitionists, and the book is about abolition and, and the way that uh, in the 1950s the, the, the issues aren't, are far from being over and they're just getting started to being worked on. Um, and it's also about prayerful, prayer, prayerful worship and the town is called Gilead, you know, straight out of the Bible. Um, so the two themes at the heart of the novel are tied up in this town, this town founded by abolitionists. We can also think about practically anything Lee Smith has written as absolutely dripping with sense of place. She's one of the masters at this. But I'll look in particular at her most recent book, the memoir Dime Store, which is wonderful. She writes this in the book. Grundy nestled in its mountains like a play pretty cotched in the hand of God, as no one once described it. Surely I could get, always count on these mountains, this river behind our house, this town where I grew up in my father's dime store, and across the street in my grandfather's office at the courthouse, and in the Methodist church, and in my grandparents' house just across Slate Creek, right next to my school. This was my geography. It would be like this forever. My daddy knew. He called it his standing ground. I could drive that road with my eyes closed, or almost, 
Twisty Route 460 as it wound up through the mountains of Southwest Virginia. I turned at Claypool Hill past Richlands and went over the heart stop at Short Gap. I passed the huge Island Creek Coal Temple, innumerable yard, innumerable yard sales held in no yard but right along the roadside. <laughs> a storefront with a big sign that said, We Buy Ginseng. Several houses turned into the kind of freelance churches where you get to scream out and fall down. Like a vision of hell itself, the coke ovens appeared as I crossed the bridge over the dismal river, brick chimneys belching red flames into the sky. We used to drive up there and park when I was a teenager. It was the most exciting thing to do on a date, also the only thing, except for the revivals in the movie that changed once a week. There was a lot of traffic as I got close to Grundy where the large haulers spill out into the main road, Garden Creek, Big Prater, Little Prater, Watkins Branch, and Hoodow Holler, just beyond the house I grew up in. Somebody was sure to greet me by rolling down the window of his truck and yelling, Hi Lee, when did you get in? So you can see that she's not only given us the topography of the place, the lay of the land, but also the heart and soul of the place with those details about the yard sales. We sell ginseng, and just the way that the uh, the way that the physical controls even getting around, you know, from one place to another on these twisty roads, and it's heart stopping and dangerous and thrilling. And also a place of violence where the land has been devastated with these uh, coke ovens taking over the mountain, etc. So, since a place must do many things, it has to entertain and inform. These are the two reasons we read. And a good sense of place enables us to capture that. If we've done our jobs as writers with sense of place, the reader will feel as if she has been transported to the world we're presenting. Reading the book or story or poem will be a means of escape, which is the most enjoyable form of literature. But place not only helps the reader to escape, but also offers a subtle education. If place has been well used, the reader will know that part of the world more intimately. Hopefully it will break misconceptions that the reader has about the specific part of the world, or even reinforce them. To capture place, we have to look at the land in different ways. We have to get beyond the surface. Instead of just saying it was a place that had mountains, we would have to capture Big Hill and that area around Big Hill and the way it feels to come down that mountain and you see this view. We have to show the reader where it is set, not just tell them. And we have to do this by getting to the bare bones of the place, to the spirit that haunts <coughs> the land and its towns, the thing that actually makes you feel as if you're in a place. For example, I just got I just got here from Nashville. I pulled in at like a quarter till, and now I'm standing up here talking to y'all. <laughs> so we, everybody knows that Nashville is the country music capital of the world. So a novice writer would set a story in Nashville and not know what they wanted to know. They wouldn't really research the town and get to know it. And they, the writer would end up being like one of those people who goes to Nashville and buys one of those cheap cowboy hats and walks around down Broadway. And that's all they see in Nashville, right? Um, for somebody like me, if I wrote, if I wrote about Nashville, I have such an emotional tie to it. Uh, country music because country music is wrapped up with the older people in my family and the way that they, I experience country music with them. So, you know, that would be one thing I would home in on is that feeling of the heritage of country music or, um, and the feel of the river and the way it's a real river place and things like that. Um, and right now, the way it's a boom town, you know, the, the locals call it Crane City right now because there's so much construction going on. Now, with all that being said, you might be thinking to yourself, but I don't have a sense of place. I always have people who tell me that. And I'm lucky because I do have a deep gestational result of place in Kentucky, but <clears throat> I come from really poor people who never stayed on one patch of land for very long. They they sort of had to move around and find where the work was, you know, and they went from coal camp to coal camp or factory to factory and things like that. But the stories for me are the gestational result of the place because the stories are what I grew up hearing. I heard those stories of my family and that's my connection to the place is so rooted in that. When I think about leaving Appalachia, the thing that always bothers me is thinking about not hearing those stories being told 
like, if you go to the dentist's office, and where I grew up, or even in Berea, people are sitting there telling stories and they're talking to each other, you know, and that doesn't happen in all places. That doesn't happen in a lot of places. And, you know, those cadences and all that. About two years after I moved here, I, I, I was raised only about an hour from here, so it's really close and in lots of ways very similar, but also very different. That hour is really long in, in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. And I was really homesick. I'm still homesick because, you know, um, I was really homesick for the first two or three years. And one time I had to go out here towards the big hill to this little hardware store to rent a U-Haul to move a piano or something. And the little old man who was waiting on me called me honey. And I almost, I almost busted out crying because I hadn't heard him. By, I hadn't heard a man say that to me since I had moved to Berea. Whereas it's fairly common where I grew up for an older man to say that to somebody younger than them. So that's a good sense of place to tell, you know, that sort of thing. Um, although my most recent novel set in Key West, I, I had to gain that gestational sense of place for Key West. Even though my main character is not a native, <coughs> he really has the same point of view I would have in that he is a visitor there. He, in fact, he's on the run from the law, and he's run off to Key West to sort of hide out, to hide in plain sight in a tourist place, you know. Right, right. Yeah, that was the it was the most exotic, farthest place he could drive to in about a day. So it works on that level. But I had to, even though he's only there a couple of months, I had to know everything about Key West because. If I don't, I'm going to miss something. I have to know what my character doesn't know. So even though he's only there two months um, in 2016, I read the whole history of Key West. <clears throat> you know, so I can tell you all about the pirates of Key West, for instance, even though that has nothing to do with my novel. I took a subscription to the little local newspaper, which is just a little small town paper. It's mostly obituaries and, you know, <clears throat> what people there are concerned with. They're really concerned with the way the cruise ships are affecting the reef and, and the tourism. They're really concerned <coughs> with the oil from the oil spill from several years ago, etc. Um, I went down and I spent a lot of time in the botanical gardens getting to know the flora as much as I could. That was really important to me. I spent as much time as I could there just kind of studying the quality of light. That was really important to know what colors the sky are in the evenings and the mornings because that's different just about everywhere. Although it's something that we think is fairly common everywhere, but it's very different. Um, I got to know the people who live there and the, the culture's so distinct. You know, I really had to understand the Key West state of mind. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. And so, yeah, people who seceded yeah. from Florida, yeah. Florida. Yeah. Right, because they, they got so tired of feeling so oh. cut off from the rest of, you know, yeah. being ignored yeah. by the rest of the state, and yeah. it became the gauntlet public. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Also, I had to understand his sense of place. He's a preacher from a little small town outside of Nashville. Well, I pretty much understood that because he's an evangelical preacher and I was raised evangelical, so I knew all that because I had been, you know, to church 16 hours a week as a child. Um, and also, I spend a lot of time in Nashville because I do a lot of work there. I'm a, a music writer. Most of that is anonymous writing that I do in Nashville. Um, and so I knew that perspective, um, but I still had to always be thinking of he seeing Key West from that point of view. So there were two layers of sense of place there for one. Now, one thing people will say to me after I talk about this, they'll say, yeah, but aren't writers just supposed to have imaginations? And I mean, of course, of course, you use your imagination, but 
you, you can't just plug things out of the, you know, the air. You have to have something to back that up. You have to know the place, and then you look at it imaginatively and expand on that, you know? Um, it has to feel credible. Right, <laughs> right. And it has to feel palpable. So it goes beyond the research, too. It has, you know, I mean, the whole job of the writer is to articulate it. That's, that's the whole job that, that you have is lots of people think about these things, but we have to articulate it. And we also have to think about it on another level past what normal people think about to articulate it even more. We, we put that unthinkable stuff into words as writers. So it's a pretty big order that we have. I taught a class a few years ago that was all about sense of place. And in that class, three of the books we read were My Antonia by Willa Cather. Uh, four of the books, I'm sorry. My Antonia by Willa Cather, The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy, Color Purple by Alice Walker, and River of Earth by James Steele. So one is set in the plains of Nebraska, one in the rural countryside of southern England, one in rural Georgia, one in the rugged mountains of eastern Kentucky. Each of the novels is completely shaped by the place wherein they are set. In each, we were able to easily identify the place as a character, as a palpable force that the reader is always aware of, that's shaping the story. The authors of these books accomplish that by always reminding us of the place and how it's affecting the characters. They do this by commenting throughout the book on several different factors that help us to understand but it's mostly done through the psyche, and they see and know the place better. So I, I hope you'll write down, these are the ten things that my students and I came up with that we felt like connected all sense of place writing. John, I think you've heard this before because you've been I in my class. Yeah. <laughs> I still have it. So the first one is the way people interact with one another. And I should, I have to step aside here and say, everything that I'm going to tell you for these next 10 are generalizations about a place. But we have to know a general sense of a place to be able to challenge those notions. For example, a Appalachia in general is a conservative place. That's pretty easy to prove if we just look at the way people vote. That's all you have to do to prove that. However, if you sit down individually with people, not everybody is going to be conservative. So you see what I mean? So on one hand, you present the place as in that general sense of being, for example, conservative. But then when you get in the book or the story, you can expand on that generalization or you can challenge it. And both of those things are still using that general sense of place. So an example of that is, you know, if you had a well, I'll get to that in a minute. First, let me say, um, I'm talking about here how people interact, how they talk to each other, how much they touch one another or don't. Do they keep to themselves or have big gatherings all the time? What about your specific place that speaks to this? Characters that openly embrace, though they barely know someone, tell us something about the place in the same way that characters who air kiss reveal something about their culture. Um, an example I can give you of this is um, where I was raised, it was really rural, and even your closest neighbors were either kin to you or you had known each other for generations. Your grandparents were neighbors with their grandparents and things like that. So I never noticed this, but one Thanksgiving my college roommate came home with me and um, <coughs> At the end of the day, he was just so harried, and he said, everybody is so angry at you. are all hollering at each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we communicate. That's how we talk to each other. And I realized that one reason is because we could do that, because, you know, we're out. There's nobody else around, so we can just holler across the yard, you know, some instruction or something. I mean, my mother came to the top of the stairs before Thanksgiving. She said, y'all, come on and eat right now. Well, he thought that was hateful. <laughs> he thought she was mad because he didn't have that cultural understanding. So the way people interact. Now, with that said, there's plenty of people in that same culture who are very soft-spoken and, you know what I mean, would never do that. But I think culturally that's pretty common. 
to talk to each other that way, and that's why many of you are recognizing that when I talk about it. Um, so on that Thanksgiving thing, food is incredibly important. Now again, you're dealing in generalizations here, because if you open a story and somebody's eating pinto beans and cornbread, they're going to have an assumption about the place. They're not going to think that's a penthouse in New York City. Well, you know, they could or could not be wrong. However, it would be much more, it would make uh, much more sense for that scene to probably be happening in a rural place than in a penthouse in New York City. But if it is happening in penthouse in New York City, you're using that to comment on place. I'll give you an example of this. Um, one time I was going down home to my parents' house to help out for the day, help my father cut wood, and so I took a, a little bowl of hummus and some pita with me, and they thought that this was a personal insult. <laughs> my mother's like, why would you want to eat that, <laughs> you know, when you can eat what I'm going to cook? Another example of that is a friend of mine um, moved to Chapel Hill in the early 80s, and her, when her mother came to visit, she was so excited to take her mother to a bagel shop because, you know, where they're from, they didn't have bagels. And so she'd gone on and on about how delicious these bagels were. So she took her mother, and her mother ate one and didn't say much. And so my friend said, well, what do you think? And she said, well, I think whoever gets excited about this never had a good biscuit. <laughs> Nothing is more uniting universally than food, because we all eat, you know? But also nothing is more specific than food at the same time. And every specific culture has specific foods, you know, that they identify with. Um, a few years ago, Sam Gleaves, who some of you know, he and I were hired to write a play for the Southern Foodways Alliance. And it was to premiere in Oxford, Mississippi, and then we toured it all over the country and, and stuff um, on this grant. Um, and they said, the only specification, they said, you can write about, you know, it can be whatever you want it to be, but it has to be about corn. <laughs> so we had to write a play about corn. And so we just sat down and brainstorm, you know, and we just wrote down the things that came to mind with corn, and then we narrowed it down. So we narrowed it down to, um, Cornbread, of course. Corn, period, like <laughs> corn the cob. Moonshine. Now they're all leaving my brain. We also thought of like corn syrup and how it's in uh, soft drinks, like Mountain Dew, for it's instance. Like everything. You know, and uh, that's, it's totally poison, right? <laughs> but, um, but, but what was revealed to us then when we started that brainstorm was really about the history behind all that. So if you start thinking about corn, then you think <coughs> about uh, farming, the agrarian tradition. You think about slavery. You think about the Cherokee. So, you know, you're getting at these real layers of real history. Um, and so the play ends up taking you from the Cherokee to the present day. <laughs> so it's the history of the South through corn. Um, and so it worked really. Did any of you see that play? We did it in Berea. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. What's the name of the play? In These Fields. I don't know if we'll ever do it again. It's very hard to orchestrate seven people with different careers to be in one place at one time. Economy, of course, that's important to capture a sense of place. D.H. Lawrence, uh, Sons and Lovers, Richard Llewellyn, How Green Was My Valley, James Steele's River of Earth, all three of those books were set in coal camps. The Shipping News is set in Newfoundland and deals with the fishing industry. Um, the book that I told you about, I'm working on, the, about the Cherokee, it's set in the 1950s, so it deals with tourism and the way the Cherokee are grappling with, do we sell out our culture to make money and we can use that money to buy back the land that was stolen from us? You know, the economy is so layered and important in that story. Um, I mean, just about every story you can think about is impacted by the economy in one way or another. 
Of course, dialogue, dialect. Dialect is one of the go-tos in caption sense of place. It's also the thing that if you're not really good at it, can be a total disaster. Um, I tell everybody to read The Color Purple for a master class in dialect because she uses dialect and there it becomes, the book becomes really a prose poem. It's, it's a poem. The whole novel is because of the way she uses dialect. And if you think about that novel, and I do this in my classes all the time where we'll take a page from The Color Purple and look at it and then we circle all the dialect in it and it's very very little dialect mm. but it feels like it's a lot because it's all perfect she's mm -hmm. chosen perfectly so it makes it feel like there's a lot more than there is um but not just dialect but also sort of in relation to the way people interact the way they talk to each other too in the dialogue you can show that the values of the place, the religion, value, moral codes. I mean, the first thing I went to was talking about Appalachia as a conservative <coughs> place, right, and how I can play on that. So if I have, I'm working on a short story right now about um, uh, the lead character uh, is transitioning, um, a, a trans man in the story. And so he's, you know, in eastern Kentucky. So, of course, place has to come into play in that. And in it, I'm challenging a lot of the stereotypes about people, but I'm also being true to that the place is conservative, you know? Um, <coughs> ceremonies, celebrations, think about weddings and funerals. You know, for instance, baby showers. Um, again, where I grew up, somebody died, it was a three-day <laughs> get-together. Um, I'm old enough to remember uh, funerals in the home, too. And um, that, that tradition's long gone, but that was a whole different sense of place. Like my uh, first novel, Clay's Quilt, has a home funeral in it. And when I go out across the country, that freaks people out. They don't know what to think about that, you know. Um, we just want something on that one thing. Really? It was a haunting show. Uh -huh. We had this thing about a house that they used to, they had like those uh -huh. home funerals in it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, where, also where I'm from, it's very, very, it would be very uncommon to go to a wedding and there'd be alcohol. You know, that would, that would be a big no-no. Um, whereas most places, well, that would be a given that you're going to have a champagne toast at least, you know, if not a full bar, etc. But culturally, it would be very, you know, looked down upon to have that alcohol at the, at the wedding. <laughs> Another thing I want to say about uh, ceremonies is uh, I always notice how different funerals are from place to place, too. Yeah. Because they tend, in one culture, they'll be really loud and really public grief. And another culture will be very private grief, and it's very quiet and solemn. You know, um, I, again, where I'm from, it's very common to have an altar call at a funeral. Mm -hmm. If there's not an altar call, people will like, why, yeah. were, why didn't he invite us to be saved? You know? um, I did a funeral one time back home, um, and the person who had died requested to have a female preacher. That freaked everybody out. <laughs> you know? And also, she was a Native American pastor, um, and she didn't say anything about Jesus during the whole time. So one woman got up and said, we can't, we can't bury this man without talking about Jesus. And I mean, that could only happen, you know. <laughs> it was a great funeral. <laughs> of course, time period has a, a factor in caption sense of place. Of course, if we look at To Kill a Mockingbird, <clears throat> those same issues of race are still in existence, right? But that novel set in the 1930s, if it was set in 2018, sense of place would be different. Mm -hmm. For instance, there wouldn't be mules on the courthouse square, you know, and the, et cetera, et cetera. But not just physically, it would be spiritually different as well. Um, time period shapes everything. <laughs> One thing I always remind people is when they're writing about a place that they know really well, they tend to romanticize it. <clears throat> to romanticize a place is just as damaging as to vilify it up. And I think, you know, especially when you're looking at specific cultures, it's real easy 
to fall into one of those camps. Um, I get books sent to me all the time where they're out about everything's great in Appalachia. Or I'll get one where everything's awful in Appalachia. And the book, you know, that's good is the one that's, there's good and bad. There's complexity. It's a complex, complicated, interesting place. You know, everything's great, everything's awful. There's no complexity there. So you've got to have, you got to remember those words because we tend to not want to think about that part if it's about somewhere we really care about. Of course, landscape. I put it near the end because that's what everybody, that's the first go-to, but you still got to have it. And then I think thinking about it in that terms of the concrete and the spiritual or the concrete and the abstract can really help you with sense of place. Now when I give you a list like this, I don't mean that every writer should sit down and make sure all of these are crossed off. You know, you're not trying to fill quota or anything, but you should be conscious of this when you're trying to capture sense of place. So I'll close with this quote from Pulitzer Prize winner William Kennedy. It's, it's pretty hyperbolic, but I also agree with it. Without a sense of place, the work is often reduced to a cry of voices in empty rooms, a literature of the self, at its best poetic music, at its worst, a thin gruel of the ego. I love that thin gruel of the ego. I love Instagram. It's my favorite social media because you don't see people's opinions that much. <laughs> but I always think of this line of thin gruel of the ego when somebody's Instagram is only selfies. And what it makes me think of is it makes me think of sense of place because you know somebody will be they'll go to this great place, but the only picture they post of it is of themselves. <laughs> and I'm like, you're in Hawaii and you're showing me you. you know, like, it's, uh, it's a thin curl of the ego. Is what it is. So I unfollow them. Ninety percent selfies. I'm oh my gosh. But um, if we had more time, I would give you all a writing prompt. But I'll just tell you that quickly. You might want to take a picture of it to take it home with you. Um, but I'll just, this is something I do a lot in workshops and places where I'll just tell people to take about five minutes to think about a place you know really intimately. And then answer these questions. What do you smell? What do you know about the quality of lights? What is specific about the way people interact? What do you hear? Make a list of five concrete things and five abstract things. But you'll see right here, I'm talking very much about the sensory. So this is the most simple thing, but it's also the best thing I've ever learned as a writer, is that as a writer, I always have to be thinking, see, hear, taste, feel, smell. Writers must have the senses of an animal. You must, a writer must have heightened senses. They have to pay attention to the smell that the non-writers are, you know, just barely registering. They have to notice the, the quality of light beyond the way non-writers are. You have to have you have to be like an animal is the way I always think of writing. And then I teach a class at Maria called the Art of Observation. And that's one thing that we do in there is we just learn how to, you know, be more aware of our senses. Um, I took them to Ireland with that class a few years ago and they weren't allowed to have their phones at all and they could only have a notebook. And so it really made them notice things in a different way. When it started out they were all so hesitant, you're like I'm going to be in a foreign country and not have my phone, you know, what am I going to do? And by the end, they were like, I'm so thankful to have had three weeks without my phone. They couldn't wow. believe it was life-changing for them in a lot of ways. I mean, they were allowed to, you know, check in at the end of the day and all that. They just couldn't rely on their phone to record. And I do this too. As a writer, photographs are really important to me. So I often will, since I always have the phone, I mean, I'll take a picture of something to remember it. But that exercise is good because it forces you to articulate what you're seeing in the moment, you know, instead of taking the picture. Mm -hmm. So, any questions? We have about five minutes. What were those five novels that you read in the past? Uh, there were four. Purple. My Aunt Tania by Will Capper, The Color Purple by Alice Walker, um, The Mayor of Casterbridge by Tom Sardy, and The River of Earth by James Steele. However, I would change that Hardy because that's my least favorite Hardy novel. I, my favorite is uh, Tess. Tess, The Woodlanders, and Jude the Obscure. I can't choose between those three. Jude the Obscure. 
One of my happiest times in my whole life was when I got to go to Thomas Hardy's woods where he grew up and just walked for two hours through these woods. Yeah. What were you going to say? Once you've got your first draft done, something new, what's your editing process? What kind of things are you looking for that maybe you overemphasized or didn't put in that you feel like you need to add to the next novel? Well, first of all, every revision I do is differently focused. Okay. So I'll do one revision where I'm going in, <clears throat> and I'm just looking for adverbs and adjectives. Mm -hmm. And I'm making sure that every adjective and adverb is absolutely necessary. Most of the time, an adverb can be replaced by a strong verb, and an adjective can be replaced by a strong noun. That's the you know real foundation of writing: strong nouns and verbs. But every once in a while, you know, there's the perfect adverb and the perfect adjective. Um, I go through. I really don't want people will put my book down halfway through, so I look a lot at um, pacing, propulsion, an element of suspense that I want to go through the whole arc, mm -hmm. character development. There's not a book that you love that doesn't have a strong character in it. That's why you, I mean, when I think of Color Purple, I think of Celie and Shug, and, um, when I think of River Birth, I think of the Little Boy. When I think of the Dollmaker, I think of Gertie. When I think of Fair and Tender Ladies, I think of Ivy. When I think of Tess, I think of Tess and, and Angel and Alec and, you know, Izzy and all of them, etc. My point is the character is the most important thing. Um, the main thing is I want to make sure that, my, that there's rhythm and that my sentences are strong. Because I don't revise... I write in scenes, and so I'll go back and revise the scene once, then I move on to the next scene. So then, you know, then I have my book, and then I go back and do full revisions. Now some people revise, you know, much more than that in the moment. I like to revise after I have the full thing. A friend of mine revises every sentence before he goes on. I would never get done. <laughs> yes. Uh, in talking about sense of place, uh, what about the micro place? Um, for instance, a holler, and mm -hmm. knowing familiarity with the seams of the slate or uh, yeah. shale in the creek bed or whatever. That's the net. If we'd had more time, I would have thought to this is what I call spatial sense of place. So, like mm -hmm. you're saying, you're getting see how it's getting closer and closer. Oh, okay. um, so I'm getting down to a specific room on the campus at East Tennessee State University, which is the last place I did this, this okay. thing on spatial sense of place. But it keeps getting, you know, it would be the South, Kentucky, uh, Berea, uh, the Berea Public Library, this room. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, we keep homing in. Um, that's where I have the most fun, you know. And a room like this is really hard to capture, you know, an indistinct room. Um, that's not like a home or something. Um, so you, that's where you just have to be even more aware of the sensory, you know, and um, the people populating the room, the wet, the sounds. If, if I may, what about the, um, there's a feeling, you were talking about feeling, so, um, you know, sit, standing by a creek, writing mm -hmm. that feeling you get of, well, that's why when I'm writing about a creek, I go to the creek to write about it, you know. I, I want to be as close to what I'm writing about as possible. I almost always write outside as the weather will allow. I'm on my porch writing, you know, from, I don't know, early April to mid-October at least. And the rest of the time I'm usually writing at the kitchen table or on a couch. Um, I don't like it. I don't like it best. It feels too formal to me. I want to be some more communal. Um, I wrote my first three books with a child on my knee, so yeah. chaos does not bother me. I sort of feed on that as a writer. Um, so I like to be out more in the public space of the house, but I like to be outside. Yeah. Notebook or laptop? Always laptop. I, I my brain, my hand can't keep up with my brain. I'm a I, I'm slow. I switch. Oh, that problem? Yeah. I, I switch. I'll get, I'll get going, ballpoint yeah. pen, and a spiral notebook, and then my 
I can't keep up with it and I have to switch. <laughs> but what I do like to do by hand is take notes. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use my phone for notes or speak into something for notes. I like to write it down. So I keep a little notebook with me. Like it's memory better that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do it. Me too. Yeah. Anything else? Is there like some sort of a ratio of what you know about the place and what you use about use of that knowledge and what you're writing? About? I think you use about ten percent of what you know about it. You know, if I'm just plucking a figure out, my point is you have to know way more than what shows up on the page. And if you don't, it'll show up in the between in the white space that you don't, you know. My, I mean, my biggest nervous thing about my new book was when it came out and how Key West people would react mm -hmm. to it. So I had a lot of Key West people read it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a book right now that's set in Ireland. So I have a lot of Irish people reading it. And I mean, I spend a lot of time in Ireland, but I, I don't have that gestational sense of place. So they're helping me with that, you know. Think about also, if you're writing something set in the far past, you're really writing about a different place altogether. You know, if you're writing about Berea in 1855, well, it, you know, it's a whole different, it doesn't matter if you live in Berea all your life, you've got to know a whole different kind of Berea, you know? So, we all have to do that in one way or another. I mean, I wrote three books that were set over the course of the 20th century in Appalachia, and I lived in Eastern Kentucky all my life, but I had to get to know Eastern Kentucky in 1914. Mm -hmm. I had to totally, I looked at so many pictures and I listened to the music of the period and, mm -hmm. and I tried to put myself in that place as much as I could. You know, uh, for one thing I thought a lot about was how we don't understand darkness the way people in 1914 did. So I would go up in a, I would go out in the woods at two o'clock in the morning without a flashlight or anything to sort of experience the darkness in that way. Um, you know, just little things like that that get me more in touch with the characters. Well, I could talk for another hour easily, and I would if y'all had to hush me on the phone. But I'd love to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. If you have a book, I'd love to sign it. And if you want a book, I have a few. So thank, thank you all very much. Thank you.